Okay, so we're going to come back to that video in a second. So here is the Eastern philosophy intro presentation. A cup of tea. So um, the other day I told a couple of stories. Um, a lot of the Eastern philosophy is told in stories. And there's a famous, I actually like tea, so I'm having tea today, but there's a famous story that explains how you learn Eastern philosophy. There was a Eastern, um, professor, Eastern philosophy professor from America who went to visit an actual Eastern um, philosophy master, a Zen master. And the Zen master is talking to the um, professor, and the professor is going on and on about how he observes Eastern philosophy and what he thinks and blah, 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 blah. And the man, the, the, the professor is going on and talking, and the master, the Chinese master, um, is says, would you like some tea? And starts pouring him some tea. And he, oh, thank you, and he's holding his glass up. And the, the master keeps pouring the tea as the tea is basically going over the ends of, of the cup. And the Chinese master says, what are you doing? Uh, the, excuse me. The professor says, what are you doing? My cup is full, my cup is full. And the Chinese guy said, well, that is how you learn Zen, because until you empty your own cup, there's no way that you can really learn about Chinese philosophy. So what that means is a lot of Eastern philosophy, the cup of tea represents that your mind is already full of what you think it is, or in general, your thoughts. You kind of have to empty the way you look at life to kind of understand a lot of the stuff that they think is so important. It's a cause, of, basically a shift of perception. You're just going to look at something slightly different than you ever looked at it before, and that's going to take on new meaning. Anybody know what those are? Oh, we had some caterpillars. Caterpillars. Caterpillars? Now, if you were alive and conscious in 1981, you know that those are not caterpillars. You know that those are gypsy moths. Yep. Gypsy moths, they come out every once in a while. Gypsy moths, um, in 1981, came out. It was basically, um, you could not go outside without 10 gypsy moths falling on your head. This is a picture from 1981. This is one tree. They kind of look cute until there's a billion of them surrounding them. Last year, no, it was bad. last year it got bad. Some of you know what I'm talking yeah, about. It, was it literally at nighttime, if you were sitting, you can like in the woods, you can hear. It sounded yes. like it sounded like rain, but really it's all their poop landing on the ground. Oh, oh and them it's them eating the leaves. Eating the leaves. Well, yeah, and that it's just oh, raining. Hey, they're they're awesome. coming out right now. But yeah, here's the are. thing. But here's I've the thing. I've seen some more. Yeah. This is the point. Generally speaking, we don't like gypsy moths because they're so invasive. If you knew, if you knew what I was talking about in 1981, you'd be like, what? It, it seemed like the end of the world. Last year, they started coming out. Some places in Connecticut like lost a lot of the, all the leaves off their trees. I came home to my house one day, and there were easily 100 gypsy moths on the side of my house. And then it just stopped. You know why it stopped? You know what kills gypsy moths? Rain. Rain. Who said that? Excellent. And so here's what I'm saying. Most people would say, oh, it's a rainy, ugly day today. I hate that. The fact that it's raining in May means we're not going to have this in the rest of the summer. Wow. If it keeps raining, it's going to mean these don't come here. If it's not raining in May and it's sunny every day, we will get <coughs> these like crazy again. That's why I'm saying a shift in perception. Most people would say, I hate rainy days. But rainy days are actually keeping us from being taken over by these disgusting things. I thought they were cute until there were like, how many of you had them at your house? Oh. Did I bite? Do you remember how bad? No. no. Well, you thought they were like, like, and, like, like, and like at Mike's house in the bag, they ate all the leaves on the trees. So what happened is they lost their food source and they started eating the pine trees because they couldn't. They lost all their food source and then they died out. But what I'm trying, my point of it isn't about gypsy moths. It's the point that we perceive rain yeah. as being bad, but rain is really good right now. A lot of people don't know. It's good that you know that. It was so boring earlier. Eastern philosophy is kind of like one of those magic eye pictures, you know what I'm talking about? You look at it, you look at it, and something pops out. Or somebody described it as like a light switch turns on. A lot of it seems repetitive, a lot of it's stories, but all of a sudden maybe that light switch flicks on and you see something that you didn't see before. So the concept up on the, the board there are a couple of, I didn't put magic eye pictures, no. I just put a couple of general things. No. Um, the one on the right, Melina, what do you see on the one on the right? four faces and those two little lamps. Right, you might see four faces, or you could just see the two lamps. You see that flip back and forth? Is there four or is there three? Uh, there's seven. There's seven. <laughs> the concept is 
optical illusions make our brain interpret things differently. I would argue that generally speaking, we observe the world the same way all the time. But if you can shift your perception, you'll see things there that maybe were there all along that you never saw. This is one of my favorite paintings. I have it at my house. What is it a painting of? A face. It's like a, a, it's like a dog. I see his face. I see his face. It's like a mountain range. I see a face. It's like a, it's like a, a desert. desert. Now this is by a man named Salvador Dali. It's apparition of a face in a fruit dish. He had a whole strategy, but if you haven't seen it, well, this is Salvador Dali. He has nothing to do with Eastern philosophy. But he had a concept called the, the paranoid uh, critical theory of surrealism. What that means is he made art that had ambiguous images to force our brains to look at life differently. So going back to this picture, some people just see a table. Here is a bowl of fruit. Here is a little milk thing with a banana peel. Maybe others see a face. Here are the eyes. Here's the nose. Here's the mouth. Maybe some of you see a dog. How many of you see that the dog actually is a road? There's a bridge that goes over and it goes through, and here's the road going yep. up because there's a beach scene in the back. He tried to put as many images there as possible to make your brain look at life differently as you would in a painting. And most of his work is like that. There's a upstairs, isn't there a Salvador Dali on the wall? By yeah. the, um, and he did a lot of stuff. I don't know if you like this or not, but it makes your mind not really sure. Did anybody not see the dog until somebody said it? Did you not? Now do you see the road? Yeah. There's the road. It's actually a beach scene. There's people there asking for towels. Is that a dead fish? Shift the perception. So, Eastern philosophies, they all have different outlooks on life. So, a lot of the Western philosophy we were doing um, was talking about how we know things or what the meaning of life is. But you remember the earlier in the year we did like the Stoics who took the emotion out of life? We did it to the Ep Epicurus who said that like, life was about pleasure and minimizing pain. There are a number of different philosophies we're going to talk about. In Vita Vedanta, we're going to talk about this week. This is the philosophy out of India, um, and we're going to talk about it really soon. Jainism, uh, is it pronounced Jainism? I'm not even sure if it's pronounced that way. I've never said it out loud. This is what Gandhi was, uh, basically the concept of nonviolence, and we'll get into that. Taoism, everybody know what Taoism is? This is the yin yang, this is sort of go with the flow, this is your nature philosophy. So you're asking if they're a bunch of nature lovers. Taoism learns everything you can know from nature. We're going to learn about Confucius. Confucius is probably the most biggest outlier of all of the Eastern philosophies. His way is most normal to someone like us in the Western world. It has rules, it has laws, and they make sense. We've got Buddhism, which has a, a large series of things. When you think of Buddhism, what do you think of? Buddha. You think of Buddha, what's Buddha? A fat guy. A fat guy. Like a monk. Is it the guy who found Nirvana or something like that? Buddha's a guy, and actually he's represented by different different ways in different places. One place has a big, like, smiling fat guy. Other places have different things, but he was just a guy, he wasn't a god. And finally, we're going to cover Zen. Zen, I think you'll probably like the best, that's why I put it last. Zen makes you think about life differently, um, and it will probably blow some of your minds. Maybe not. Okay, so I think you all know this, but motivation affects how you perceive things. Meaning, the way you look at life is colored by the way your mind works. So, for example, Eastern philosophy tries to make you look at life with an open mind. Some of you, what's a preconceived notion? Something that you expect to happen. How many of you thought the anteater, you had kind of an image in your mind of what an anteater is, was it slightly different than it actually was? Yeah. I think it was a lot bigger than I thought. Yeah. You thought yeah. it was bigger than what we saw? No, I thought it was smaller. You saw it was smaller? What did you think about it? I thought it was smaller. So, and it's a lot bigger. It's a big animal. I mean, the point is, we have always ideas in our head, preconceived notions. So like the cup of tea, if our cup of ideas is full, we're not going to be able to take in new ideas. You have to kind of look at life with an open mind according, according to them. So there's a few quotes we've uh, talked about. One of them, you don't see things as they are. You see them, uh, you don't see things as they are. You see them as we are. This is one. This comes out of Persia. When the whole world smells of fish, you are in need to clean your nose. That's sort of an odd thing to say, but here's the story. So there's a, a person named Nasruddin. Nasruddin comes up in a lot of the uh, ancient parables and tales. 
Nasruddin was on the path walking across um, the desert, and he runs across another man walking the other direction. And oftentimes, you don't see people walking on the paths, uh, traveling like that. So, you know, they're actually naturally lonely. So they sat down and they talked about their experiences. They shared food. And as they were getting up to leave and part and continue on their way, the, the first man asked Nasruddin, he said, well, I'm going to the town, I think, where you just came from. Could you tell me what that town is like? And Nasruddin said, okay, but first tell me how the town you're leaving was. He said, well, the town I was leaving, those people were awful. They were all evil. They are out to get me, every single one of them. I'm lucky I got out of there alive. And Nasruddin said, oh, well, the place you're going, the people are just like that as well. Do you understand? Yes. The people are going to be as you view them. If you think everybody is out to get you, your whole life, everybody's going to be out to get you. Your mind will basically color how you perceive things. Explained another way, Baba Hare Das, he said, if a pickpocket needs to say, all he sees are his pockets. So like the most holy person in the world can walk in, or the, whoever it is, and if you're a pickpocket, you don't see what, you don't, what you're not looking for. Your perceptions color everything you know. Eastern philosophy tries to get you to get rid of your natural perceptions. And this is probably the most challenging of the quotes. George Gurdjieff, he was a Russian philosopher. If you think you're free, you don't know you are already in prison, and you can't escape. He thought it was a prison of the mind. You are stuck looking at things the same way, you'll think about things the same way, you'll make assumptions, you'll have preconceived notions, until you realize that my mind is coloring my world for me, you'll never be able to see things as they really are. So most people, I would include your parents and your, most of your teachers, um, probably would be kind of stuck with a lot of the Eastern philosophy stuff that we're going to talk about. We have a practical mindset. We have an individualistic mindset. Um, so here are some basic concepts so that you can understand what Eastern philosophy is about. Wisdom is a state of mind and approach to life that cannot be reduced into words. Words are our tools in the West. We're all about talking. We, all, we want to make arguments, we want to use reasoning, we want to basically talk things out. In actuality, they are much more about actions and attitudes. They would say to try to chop reality up into little pieces is a waste of time. Where do they spend their time? Do they spend their time in their mind thinking about the past and the future? Where do they spend their time? In the present moment. In the present moment. So basically, how you live your life is what's important not your theories or your arguments. You guys want another one? Those stories help understand things? Yeah, it's pretty cool. You like those stories? Here's another one that kind of will explain this. This is a, not a Nasruddin story, but it also comes from the Middle East. There was uh, a boy, and he went to his father because his father was getting older. And the boy realized, well, I better learn the tricks of the trade of my father's job so that I can support the family once he's too old to do it. So he went to his father and said, could you please teach me? how you make your money, the job you have. Now the thing that was interesting is his father was the most successful burglar in all of the area. And so he was basically asking, could you teach me how to be a burglar? And the father said, sure, come with me tonight. So that evening they went out to the richest town, the richest house in the whole village, and they snuck in. The father showed them how to break through the fence. They went up, they tiptoed into the house, up the stairs, went up into the attic. They went up to the big chest um, where all of the riches were and the the, the father used a little crowbar, not crowbar, but he used um, burglar tools and opened up the chest very quiet. And he told his son, the jewels are always hidden in the bottom of the chest. You have to get in to find them. And the son stepped into the chest and looked down. He couldn't see them. The father said, you have to duck down if you want to see them. The, the child basically gets on his knees to find the jewels. And his father closes and locks the chest. And then his father then tiptoes out of the house out to, the, out, to his, um, out to the road, but before he goes out to the road, actually, he takes a big rock and he throws it up and smashes the window in the room, in the attic, where the chest was and his son is now locked. And then he leaves. Now, obviously, the people in the house are going to hear when the rock breaks the window. And so they come up, they run upstairs, and they look around. They can't find anything. Of course, the boy is in the chest. And so as they're about to leave, the boy in the chest, at first he was nervous they were going to find him. And then he realizes, oh my gosh, they're not going to find me. I'm going to die in this chest. And so as the last person is leaving the maid, 
he begins to scratch at the inside of the chest, hoping that the maid will think, maybe it's a rat. And so the maid heard the scratching and opened up the chest. And he jumps out, he blows out the candle of the, um, the maid, jumps out the window, and basically runs down the street. Now the family heard all of this happen. They pick up weapons and they chase after him. He's running for his life, and as he's running for his life, they're catching up to him. They've got weapons. He comes to a well. He takes a big boulder. He throws it in the well, so there's a big splash. And then he hides next to the well, and all of the people go to the well, and they're basically going to fish out his dead body, because what he's done is he robbed from them. While they're fishing out the boulder, he basically sneaks home. And when he gets home, his father says, how did it go? And he says, why have you been so cruel to me? That is ridiculous. And he said, I've only done what you asked. Now you know how to be a murderer. Point of the story meaning you only know how to live life through living and not by talking about it. The odd thing is I'm going to talk about Eastern philosophy, which has nothing to do with life, but it's the best way to kind of get the idea across. So this is Bruce Lee. You guys know Bruce Lee? Yeah. The Dragon. The Dragon. Some people have actually seen his videos, but he was very uh, successful in using his um, martial arts talent to express the message. This quote, quote right there is excellent. A teacher is never a giver of truth. He is a guide, a pointer to the truth that each student must find for himself. So rather than kind of telling you this is the way it is, you just suggest the way it is, and then you can find it for yourself. So a lot of the Easter stuff we're doing, I'm going to give you stories. I'm going to give you their beliefs. And then you can find for yourself what's true. Here is a... Here is a clip I referred to earlier, if you've never seen who Bruce Lee is. No, it's not the one where he fights Chuck Norris. Take me. Take me. What was that? An exhibition? We need emotional content. <coughs> Try again. I said emotional content, not anger. Now try again with me. on the finger or you will miss all that heavenly glory. Do you understand? So if you think about the anteater, you have an image in your mind of what an anteater is, which is fine, <coughs> just like that person was going to think. It, the idea of Eastern philosophy is you just sort of feel the truth beyond your thoughts. The less you think, the more you just get it. The more you live through something, the more you're going to learn. So another example, this is Alan Watts about ego, because we've been talking about the egoic mind. The ego is simply your symbol of yourself. Just as the word water is a noise that symbolizes a certain liquid without being it, so too the, e the idea of the ego symbolizes the role you play, who you are, but it is not the same thing as your living organism. Okay, one of the big things in Eastern philosophy is science. So Hinduism is basically a lot of India. Buddhism is a lot of uh, China. Actually, all of all of the eastern, um, far eastern countries. In Indonesia, what is the mix as far as you know, Putri? What do you mean? In terms of are most people Hindus? Are there a lot of Buddhists? Is it a mix? Are there other sort of uh, philosophies and faith that come into play? In Indonesia. In Indonesia, yeah. Well, if it's talking about religion, I mean, most of them are Muslim. Most of them are Muslim. Okay. But in the island that I live in, yeah. most of them are Hindu. On your island, Hindus. Okay, good. Um, so meditation. Meditation is a big part of this sort of words don't do any good. So when that kid was trying to think about how the martial arts expedition went, 
um, you're trying to think. They use a lot of meditation. Now, how many of you actually tried a little meditation earlier in this year? When we did it, the sort of, maybe you got something out of it, maybe you did it. We're going to talk about it. I'm going to try to get Mr. Uh, Drap to come in and talk about his years of doing it. But when you're being silent, it's often they're referring to silence of the mind. How to make your mind basically stop yelling at you and bothering you. The idea is, when you have no more thoughts, who you really are can come through. I think some of you are beginning to see that and get that. A lot of times what I find, um, the best journals you write a lot of times are the most late at night. Because when you're most late at night, your thinking tends to become a little less organized. And who you really are kind of comes out more. So uh, Buddhism, the Hindus, and Taoists, this is an important concept. They see enlightenment, that's sort of like the goal. It's not like something happens to you, some like heavenly vision, like all of a sudden you just understand the secrets of the universe. That's not what they believe. Instead, they say that it comes, and this is important, stripping away your normal attitudes and your ego-based desires. In other words, I want stuff. Oh, I don't like that at all. And the way we have attitudes. If you can get rid of that and get back to your brain like the Zen call beginner's minds, Beginner's mind is how you were before ego was put a, placed upon you. If you can get back to that, ordinary reality becomes miraculous. So um, there's a, one of the videos I'm going to show one of these days is birds flying around, like thousands of them flying around in really cool patterns. Do any of you just ever notice when the birds are basically leaving or coming during the time of the year? Yeah. Like you stop, and isn't it kind of amazing? Maybe a lot of you don't see it. That to them, if you've truly erased your mind, that, that ordinary thing becomes miraculous. And meditation allows you to do this. This image, by the way, in case you're wondering, this is supposed to be Buddha. He was a guy. He was a prince. We'll talk about him. And he basically sat under a tree called the Bodhi tree, and a lot of th thoughts came to him. And that's the basis of that philosophy. As you've seen, um, Eastern philosophy uses a lot of riddles and stories and analogies to express their teaching. It's basically circular, sometimes repetitive. You're going to hear the same thing from different directions. The concept being one of them will flip the switch so you'll truly understand. So are you, the stories help at all? Yeah. Let's do another one. Two monks and the lady. If you said no, I would have slipped the rest of the slides. So thank you for saying yes. Is Zach with us still? Yeah. Okay, I can't tell. Two monks and the lady. So the concept is there are two monks, and they have sworn um, a lot of different vows, uh, chastity, not basically messing with the other sex, and they're basically giving up all of what we would call sins. And they're walking along, and they come to a river, and on one side of the river is a pretty lady. You can't really see her in that picture, but she's a pretty lady. And she says, this is a brand new dress. I can't possibly go across this river. I will ruin my dress. Now, the monks had also taken a vow of silence. And so one of the monks was surprised when the second monk said, yes, I will carry you. And he carries her across the river, <laughs> dropping her off on the other side. Then the monks continue on for day after day after day. On the third day, the first monk, the one who did not carry her across the river, says to the second monk, really angrily, how could you do that? We're not supposed to touch women. We're not supposed to talk. How could you do that? The monk who carried her said, I left the lady at the other side of the riverbank. Why are you still carrying her? Meaning our minds tend to kind of carry thoughts, and we carry grudges, and we carry opinions, rather than just leaving them where they are in sort of the present time. Another concept of Eastern philosophy, everything is always changing. Some of you have seen that over the year. And often things go in a cyclical manner. Somebody wrote that last night in a journal. If you don't know it, as things live and then they die. The leaves, all of the leaves are coming in now, and it's springtime, and some people get allergies, that's bad, but the springtime's coming, here are all the leaves, there's green, the grass grows, and then the fall <laughs> comes and all the leaves tend to die, and then the cycle goes over again. This is the yin-yang, we will talk about it in Taoism. It's the concept that yin-yang is a circle. So there's good, and then there's bad, and over here there's bad, and then there's good, and the circle kind of turns. So the idea is they believe in Eastern philosophy that things are harmoniously interconnected in ways we can't understand. I don't know if you ever noticed that. You won't find, well, I'll ask you this. Why do some people say, I think they'd say Einstein said, I don't think he did, 
But as soon as the bees die off, we're next. You've heard that concept? Yeah. Where does that come from? What concept does that go along with? If there's no bees, the butterfly effect. Well, there's a butterfly effect, but what do bees always occur directly with? Flowers. You, flowers. Bees and flowers. There's a pollination cycle there. When the bees die off, the flowers will die off, and the vegetation will die off, and then we'll die off. We're all part of a big mosaic. We're all part of a big fabric. <coughs> Alan Watts, we'll talk about him later on. Alan Watts said the difference between the way we think here and the way a lot of them think there is we are individual threads, basically living our own existence, traveling whichever way we travel. We somehow don't see that all of our individual threads together make the whole cloth. So therefore, we look at life much more as individuals, which has its pluses and minuses, and we don't think that we're somehow connected. So when you asked earlier, Christian, about um, the concept of the, are they like nature lovers, the concept is they think nature is us. And if you destroy nature, you destroy us. And I, is that, would that happen? Yeah. And so that's the concept. Yoda. How many of you are Star Wars? You like Star? You've seen Star Wars, or you're at least you're familiar with it. Some, not everybody. Okay. Well, we're actually going to watch a little bit of Star Wars in a couple of days. But this is a quote he has during one of his. Uh, he's talking to Luke about something. Luminous beings are we, not this crude matter. Luminous means something that emits light, something that will go on. Crude matter. He said crude matter while he poked Luke in the chest, saying that we're more than just our bodies. And then he went on talking about the force. You must feel the force around you, here, between you, me, the tree, the rock, everywhere. Eastern philosophy, Yoda is the person uh, probably that you're most familiar with. Everything he said comes from an Eastern philosophy. This, the concept of the force, is the concept that, concept that everything is interconnected. Everything in society, you and I are all interconnected in a way that we don't realize or um, give respect to. Now, this a lot of you will immediately reject, which is fine. You don't have to like it or agree with it. But a lot of Eastern philosophies think that we're all one. That there is some sort of force that unites and transcends all things. In sort of shorthand, if you recognize, I'm not talking about God, if you recognize life as it exists, be it in an anteater or an ant or us, that light is common to all of us. Is that fair to say? Are you following me? Have I lost yet? No. And so the, that's what we have in common. So obviously we're different than the ant, and hypothetically I'm different than you, but they think that something is connected between us. Yes, sir. Can I don't know my notes? Yes, sir. So Eastern philosophy is to try to live in harmony with what happens. There's a picture of a Buddha. A Buddha. Eastern philosophy tends to be much less individualistic than us. I've said this a lot, we versus me. It's really hard for us to think of us. We think of me, we think of I, we have to protect ourselves, especially in the world we live in. But think about that video I showed you earlier in class with the ants. Were they all working for the same common good? That's all they do. Now, do we work for the same common good? That's the concept. Now, are they right? Are we right? Well, we have higher intelligence, so obviously we're right, right? Yes. So here's the thing. In the West, you guys have a lot of pride. You become independent. I become independent. I shouldn't say you guys. It's me as well. We become preoccupied with us. What matters to me? Anything that ever happens, it's I, I, I. Eastern philosophy is thinking we're actually not alone. We're part of something much greater. And we'll get to that. Um, now this is, I don't know if you guys will get this or not, so just make sure you read it. It says, Westerners often develop mental thought barriers to keep themselves separated from the rest of the world. This way of thinking has encouraged Westerners to be strong and innovative. Without a doubt, we have, as Mr. Pepin was saying yesterday, we have progressed. But is it true that we also deal with these things a lot? Loneliness, alienation, depression, guilt. The way we've grown is we are individuals, each working in a dog-eat-dog -dog world, and with that comes a lot of these negative emotions. Eastern philosophy, not as much. Eastern philosophy doesn't isolate themselves, therefore there's a lot more interconnection. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but can you re recognize that 
our way of looking at our, ourselves. Like how many of you, be, be honest, the journals, I put the journal quotes on the board. How many of you see the journal quotes? I think I asked this already in this class, maybe not. But you feel kind of better that other people are looking at it the same way as you. And the, the concept is when you realize you're not alone, you're not separate in the way you think, you feel a kinship there. I said yesterday that a lot of the best experiences you'll have, most of them, in fact, all of them, will be with other beings, be it animals or people. So that's the concept, that we have developed these thought barriers saying, I'm me and you're you and that, well, let's kill the buffalo, we need that. The concept, Eastern philosophy looks at it differently. We had this quote yesterday, Einstein, we are more focused on goals for the future, always becoming, never being. Oh, he's got a cool face. He has a cool face, says Christian. So this is another story. The Chinese master, the Chinese teacher, he has a student come to him. We'll call the student uh, Pepin. You want to be the student? Yeah, sure. Pepin comes to the Chinese master and he says, I want to learn all that you know. I want to know the arts of Zen or I want to understand Buddhism or whatever it is. How long will it take? And the master pauses a second. They have really, really long, this guy has a long beard. This is a guy from Kill Bill, if you've ever seen that film. Yeah. And like he would like, kind of like massage his beard for a second. Yeah. And then he says, and then he says, how long will it take? It will take you 10 years. And the, the kid is like upset. He's like, 10 years? I need to know this like now. What if I study every minute of every day and I really focus and I, I'm literally like, if I really work really, really hard, how long will it take then? And the master says, 20 years. And he says, wait a minute. If I work twice as hard, it's going to take twice as long? And the master says, if you've got one eye on the goal, you only have one eye left for the path. And I think a lot of times we're always thinking of the goal. Now, yesterday I read a quote in class from a journal about somebody talking about the now and how we miss the now in things. We're thinking about the future without dealing with the one thing we can change, which is now. That's the path. That's a lotus flower, by the way. Did I tell you what the lotus flower represents? The lotus flower represents in Eastern philosophy, uh, it's sort of almost held holy because it's a flower that rises out of the water and grows out of the water completely unaffected by the water. It's supposed to symbolize how we potentially can grow out of our surroundings and be unaffected by our surroundings and become who we really are, not what society tells us we are. Uh, we try to understand reality. We need to know why. A lot of you are trying to figure things out in your journals. They don't worry about that. Do we try to master and control things? They don't worry about that. We need to understand things and categorize them and analyze them and bring order. They don't worry about that. They don't try to control reality. They just recognize we're all part of reality. The world goes as the world goes. It tends to be more in tune with nature and teaches to live in harmony with it. Final couple of quotes. Uh, Bala Hari Das. Life is not a burden, but we make it one. We refuse to accept things as they are. I said this yesterday, and I'll say it again, Mr. Walton. Think of all of the times in your life you've been upset about something, where you've been like, you're not just upset in the moment, but you continue, it bothers you, it continues to bother you, it causes you suffering, quote unquote. You thinking about some moments in your life? <laughs> no, you don't have to tell me one, but can well, everybody think of moments like that bother them? Here's what, if you really think about it, Life is not a burden, but we make it one when we refuse to accept things as they are. Meaning, if you're going to bed at night going, oh, I'm not this, or I'm not that, or I wish my parents were, didn't get broke, broken up, or I wish I didn't get in the car accident, all those things are true, but the idea is suffering is optional if you refuse to accept that things happen. Another one, this is from the third Chinese patriarch of Zen. The great way of, is easy, the great way of life is easy, for one with no preferences. If you have in your mind, here's the biggest mistake you can make, you ready? You have in your mind how life has to work out in order for you to be happy. If you already know, like, I'll give you an example. Um, are you, I doubt all of you are thinking about the prom, but if you're already thinking about the prom and you're thinking how awesome it's going to be, it probably won't be that awesome. You were putting an expectation there that will not be fulfilled. Conversely, if you go into something going like, oh, whatever happens, happens, without preferences, you'll be a lot more 
of at ease. Do you want another Chinese story or like to death? What is it? You love the stories? Yeah. All right, here's another one about Nasrudin. What is Prom? Here's a story about Nasrudin. Nasrudin, he was um, not someone who was trusted. He tended to be sort of funny, but he was definitely someone who was not reliable. And he went to his next door neighbor and said, I need a big pot, I'm going to cook some soup. And the next door neighbor was not that excited about that because Nasruddin was unreliable. He was sort of uh, not someone you would trust your, your valued uh, pot to. And he gives him the pot and Nasruddin cooks his, cooks his uh, soup. And the man told him, I need it back within one week. You must give it back. And Nasruddin said, I will. Nasruddin comes back four days later, knocks on the man's door, and he has a pot. And inside of the pot, or on top of the pot, there's a uh, uh, owl. And the man said, oh, I've got the pot back. He's, ex he's excited. He's like, oh my god, I wasn't expecting to get the pot. And he pulls the, the towel off the top of the pot, and inside there's a smaller pot. And the man says, that's rude. What is this other pot? This is not mine. And he said, well, the pot had a baby. And the man said, OK, thank you, that's rude. And he takes away his old pot and his new pot. About two months went by and Nasruddin knocked on the man's door again and said, "Come may I borrow your pot again? This time the man was excited. He said, here, have my pot, go ahead. And gives him his pot and Nasruddin went back and cooked his stuff. He didn't say you need it back in seven days or anything like that. Two weeks went by and the man still hadn't gotten the pot. And he ran into Nasruddin in the town and he said, Nasruddin, I didn't want to bug you, but you know, am I going to get the pot back sometime soon? And he goes, I have bad news. The pot has been poisoned by onions. <laughs> And the man said, excuse me? He goes, yes, the pot has died. It's been poisoned. And he said, wait a minute. You want me to believe that I'm not getting my pot back because he got poisoned by onion? Who is going to believe such a thing? And he said, well, the same man who believed that a pot had a baby. Wow. Concept being, the first scenario, you have expectations he wasn't going to get the pot back, and then he got a bonus pot in the deal. He wants to do that again. But now the second time it comes around, he has all these great expectations of how things are going to go. It doesn't go that way. He's like, oh, well, yeah, you're going to just back. <laughs> so general features of Eastern philosophy. We've talked about mysticism in nature. We've talked about mind control and the ego. Want one last story or no? Yes. yes. The tiger in the mountain story. These are famous stories. I didn't find these. I know them, but like, this is an image off of the internet, off of Google Images. Um, so a man, we'll call him Jack. He is walking through the, the land, and a tiger begins chasing after him. And Jack doesn't have too much time, and the tiger's really fast. So Jack actually basically makes a jump, and unfortunately, he falls off a cliff. And as he's falling off the cliff, he grabs the ground, and he's able to hold on to a root. There's a single root that holds him up. And he's like, oh my god, that was a close one. And then he looks down below him, and there's three other tigers at the bottom of the, of the place where the cliff is. Uh, basically, in his past is a tiger above him, and in the future there's a tiger below. And then in, he looks up at the roots, and there are two tiny mice eating the actual roots that are holding the roots connected to the earth. He basically is in a bad way. And then that, also at that moment, he notices at the end of the root, there's a single strawberry. And he takes the strawberry and he eats it, and he thinks, what a delicious strawberry. That's the end of the story. I understand because you know there's nothing he can do about it. Can you control what's in your past or your future? No. It all is you, what it is. It is what it is. It is you what can't it win is. them all. I like how you stole mine. That means I have to get stuck with yours. I like my bed. You can't win them all, the man said, but now I got a strawberry. Yep. That makes sense. And that's mindfulness. That's being present of what's in front of you. All he can be right then is enjoy strawberry. So to summarize, Eastern versus Western. Eastern, referring to everything. Western is all about us, or all about me. They deal much more with the soul. I haven't really got into that, but we'll talk about it. We want to have lots of knowledge. We want to know lots of stuff. Everything's interrelated. We're all separate, harmony, and reality. And the final slide is Yoda. Now, we are going to um, show you, a, or I'm going to show you a couple of clips of Star Wars, just because for those of you who likes, 
Mariah, are you a Star Wars person? Mm, Not really? Kind of. What movie like do you it. like? Huh? What movie do you like? I like the newest one, like The Force Awakens. Oh, okay, I'm talking more about the first couple ones. Okay. Which are older and they're more like in the story. But if you look at his quotes up there, these are all direct quotes out of, or concepts, out of Zen, out of Advaita Vedanta, out of Taoism, out of Buddhism, and we'll talk about it a little more. General thoughts. And the class stared at me with dismay. Dismay? That's the emotion? Mm. Good, bad, and different? We were gonna I think it's good. Usually, I hate say that. <laughs> Mr. Wilcox. <laughs> he does say that. Yes, Mariah. Usually, so like close. I'm with you on like a lot of. Usually, I'm with you on like a lot of the stuff you yep. say. For some reason today, I just it was not it wasn't clicking. That's why. Yeah. That's why. Others feel the same way. Was I? No. Like I don't really understand why we watch the videos. Like why I we watch the video? That's yeah. Fine. Uh, we watched the ants. Mm -hmm. We had a different perspective of the ants, literally at their level. We looked at them differently. Not only that, do you notice how the ants were all working together for one goal? When in actuality, we, do we all work for the same goal? We work for individual goals. Individual. Just a different way of looking at it. And the second one, the anteater was also in there because in your mind, a lot of you have an image, like your sister was saying, she thought an anteater was smaller. I did too when I saw I never saw an anteater in person. That's not person. We have these ideas in our minds, Mariah, which we think are the way life is. Are we often wrong? That's what Zen is about. Zen is basically begin, believes you should have what's called a beginner's mind. When you were a little kid, remember the first day of school and the school seemed so big? And you were like, oh my God, this is great. If you go back to your school today, it'll seem really tiny. Yeah. It's the same size. All that's changed is you. Not just your size, but the way you perceive things. Mm -hmm. Now you realize there's lots of things in the world. If you grew up in the uh, middle, middle portion of America and you never saw the beach, if you went and saw the beach the first time, you'd be like, wow, look at this. But if you grow up on the beach, after a while, you already it's know what the, the beach is. It's the same old, same old, because your brain isn't actually taking things in. It just relies on what your mind thinks it knows. So that's why we watched it. Okay. Other thoughts, comments, questions? I like the story about the tiger. You like the story about the tiger? Do you guys understand the stories? Yeah. 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 For the most part. For the most part? Well, I mean, should I, you know, I, I was debating, should I actually tell you what they mean or just leave them out there so you can figure it out? Leave, leave them, them as time bombs. Yes. That makes sense. And then tell you later what they mean? No, no. <laughs> just let us figure it out. Come to our knowledge. Oh. If we never figure it out, then tell us. Which one of those stories is least uh, useful? The child abuse one. The child about the chest? <laughs> I like the chest one. No, I like the because it taught him how to sneak through and get away from everybody to actually teach him for himself how to be a bird or like a spot. But think about what we do, even what I'm doing now. I'm explaining all of this through words because that's the only vehicle we have, but really only through living with something. I would say, for instance, and you're not a great example of this, Poochery, but this is your second language or third language? English? Well, second, third. Second, second or third. Being here, having to talk English all of the time with us, is your language better now than it was when you left? Yes. You had learned it before. You came here first day and your English was good. So I, think I feel better like, after like, spending a couple months. Being exposed and experienced something is the only way you really can learn. Yeah. We somehow think that words do justice. Um, you know, people like Einstein said that the greatest you know, education happens outside of school. And I think some of you, especially those who don't like school, would agree with that. Yeah. But not, that's not the point. The point is that you have to experience something really to understand it. You guys understand the other ones? Yeah. What was yeah. the pot thing? The pot one? Yeah. The pot, that was, you, were, you were the example too, because you were going to sleep <laughs> in that uh, pot. Wait, no, I, no, I, no, I, I, I one. He was the pot. Oh, you're the pot one? Yeah. The concept of the pot is Nasruddin wasn't trusted when the man gave him the pot. Yeah. And he surprised, the man was surprised when Nasruddin gave him back a pot. Not just give it back, there was a bonus Dude, pot yeah. inside. Expected. And then the next time the man was expecting, wow, when I give him a pot, I'm going to get stuff back. Oh, so it's like, oh, but in yeah. actuality, he didn't. If in your mind you're expecting life to work out a certain way and it doesn't, mm -hmm. You're going to be upset. I've used this. I've used this example before, but it's really true. 
if that special someone, that boy or girl you're waiting for the phone call from, if you go home and you're like staring at the phone waiting them for, for them to call, if they eventually called, all you have is, oh, they called. You have relief. But if out of the blue they call you, you have surprise. Which one is better? The idea is if you expect something to happen, it will never live up to your expectations. So you go in with an empty mind and life just takes care of itself. That man gave the pot with no expectation that he got a bonus pot back. The next time he was hoping to get like silverware inside and he got nothing. Okay? All right, we will continue this. Make sure you write journals, please. I need journals to get your thoughts. Now, um, we will uh, start tomorrow with Advaita Vedanta, which is the Hindu philosophy, um, which will be probably the most out there of the stuff we're going to talk about. Thank you.